On April 9, 2015, the people in Northern Illinois witnessed one of nature's most incredible spectacles. For those out of harm's way, this tornado was extremely beautiful, but for those in the path, it was a nightmare come true. Leading up to April 9th, forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center were well aware of the upcoming severe weather threat. All ingredients required for tornadoes were there, the shear, the moisture, and instability, or CAPE. However, the SPC initially only put out a 5% chance for tornadoes, which isn't really high for spring, peak tornado season. But early morning, forecasters noted that the atmosphere was much more volatile than what was initially anticipated. So around midday, an area of 10% hatched tornado potential was introduced over northern Illinois. The forecasters specifically mentioned the chance for strong tornadoes. Fast forward a few hours. At 4 o'clock, a large complex of storms was over the Quad Cities, but those were not the real threat. It was actually the small storm to the east that was rapidly intensifying, eventually dominating the atmosphere. Just by random chance, another storm popped up behind this dominant cell and gave the dominant storm a little push in the right spot, and at 6.39, a tornado formed north of Franklin Grove, Illinois. The Rochelle tornado started out as a tall, skinny rope, and as it moved northeast, it produced its first damage, directly impacting Crest Foods distribution plant, leaving a large hole in the warehouse. As the tornado moved northeast, it began showing signs of intensification, now leaving a distinct mark on the ground. It was right at this time when Derek Myers began recording the tornado with this incredible view from his front porch. In his video, you can see how highly visible the tornado was. It is also clearly much stronger than it was earlier in its life. While the tornado was blocked by trees from Derek's point of view, Lewis Williamson was recording the tornado from much closer. In his video, you can see the incredible structure of this tornado, a compact core at the center of a much larger, highly visible mesocyclone. The core of the tornado was like a black hole, violently pulling in everything at the ground. Up to this point, the tornado was fairly well behaved, mostly staying over open fields. However, it was now targeting several homes on the north side of Rochelle. As it moved into more populated areas, the tornado was caught on security camera as it passed by a home, missing it by less than 50 yards. But that home was lucky. The first home to come into contact with the violent core of the tornado was completely destroyed. This moment was captured by Wayne Humphrey, who was recording the beastly tornado from the north. You can see just how incredible this tornado was to witness, which is extremely unconventional because tornadoes this strong are usually shrouded in rain. But this was not a normal tornado. tornado was now moving towards Cherry Hills, a nice little subdivision on the north side of Rochelle. The first home impacted was the Johnson family home, where all walls were wiped off of the foundation. But somehow, their red Porsche was completely untouched. Fortunately, the Johnsons had taken cover and were safe. The Whitaker home next door suffered an even more tragic fate, where two dogs died from the tornado. Thankfully, Joanna Whitaker was not home at the time. The Van Vickel home was the next one hit, where the town's sheriff lived. Unsurprisingly, this home was completely leveled. There was also a dog inside, but by a miracle, the dog only suffered minor cuts and bruises. The Dickey family home across the street was the next house directly impacted by the core of the tornado. It was completely swept off of its foundation, leaving only the basement. The tornado then engulfed the Hade and Belmont homes where both families were sheltering in their basements. One of the Belmont's cars was thrown over 300 feet into their neighbor's backyard, and another was thrown into their own basement, trapping them underneath the debris. The Belmont's had to wait for emergency services to help them escape after the tornado. And by a miracle, the Haid family was untouched. The Price family's home was also totally destroyed, even though it was just south of the main core of the tornado. 
The intense moments of the tornado as it tore through Cherry Hills was captured by Anthony Camusa, who had a completely unobstructed view. In his video, you can clearly see the unfathomable motion of the tornado at the ground, raw strength that's only seen in the highest caliber tornadoes. The beast was now moving over open fields with a beautiful bright white appearance, which is somewhat ironic considering it had just wiped out a neighborhood almost killing a few different families. As the tornado moved northeast, the violent core threaded the needle between multiple farmsteads. Even though it wasn't directly impacting any structures, the tornado was leaving visible marks on the ground, showing it still possessed extreme winds. The tornado was now moving towards the intersection of Highway 251 and 64, the location of a small local restaurant, Grub Stakers. Owner Ava Murtoska was aware of the oncoming tornado from the warning she received on her phone and was able to get all her employees and customers into the storm shelter just before the tornado directly impacted the restaurant. Simultaneously, the tornado impacted multiple homes, which stood no chance for the extreme tornadic winds. All of the homes were destroyed, and their debris was carried hundreds of yards into the field behind them, where a smart car and mangled dumpster were found in the field among the debris. The tornado overtaking this intersection was captured just down the road by Dave Walker in this extremely frightening video. After passing over the intersection, the tornado was now on a direct collision course with the Dilling Farm, which unfortunately ended up taking a direct hit from the core of the tornado, completely shredding apart a two-story home, shearing a concrete silo right at its base, and debarking nearby trees. All that remained of the farmstead was a grain silo filled with corn. Thankfully, the Dilling family was not present at this time, since they were at their main home just down the road, where they took this ominous photo of the tornado right before they went down into their storm cellar. Right after impacting the Dilling farmstead, the tornado proceeded to leave extremely visible, high contrast, cycloidal markings on the ground, a feat only done by the strongest tornadoes. Moving northeast at 45 miles per hour, the tornado was now closing in on a much busier road, Interstate 39. Here, Sam Smith, a businessman traveling to Indianapolis, stopped right as the tornado passed in front of him but it looks like it's coming right towards me. Ridiculous. Oh, that is scary. The truck is, oh my gosh. Sam stopped within less than 100 feet of the strong core of the tornado. Had Sam reacted any slower and been any closer, there's zero chance he would have survived. Yeah. That is completely crazy. After crossing Interstate 39, the tornado continued northeast, leveling a section of trees, making a quick right turn, and narrowly dodging a direct impact with multiple country homes, only leaving minor damage. It was also at this time another tornado formed, traveling alongside the main tornado at 45 miles per hour. This type of tornado is called a satellite because it orbits around the main tornado just like how a satellite orbits around the Earth. This satellite tornado was captured on video by Ed Lovelady. Got that tornado and we got some spinning up here. While the secondary tornado was small and weak, there was a much bigger problem unfolding. The main tornado was heading straight for the town of Fairdale, Illinois. Here, resident Clem Schultz recorded the incoming tornado from his second floor back window as it got closer and closer. Frozen with fear, Clem held his position and continued recording the tornado until it overtook him, directly impacting his home and leveling half of the small town. This is, in my opinion, the most frightening tornado footage ever captured. Despite taking a direct hit from the violent core of the tornado and being on the second floor of his home, which is the worst thing you can do in this situation, Clem survived the encounter. Sadly, his wife Geraldine, who was doing the right thing by sheltering in a bathroom on the first floor, did not survive. Their neighbor, Jacqueline Closa, also perished. Jerry and Jackie would end up being the only two deaths from this tornado. 
and coincidentally, they were close friends. The harrowing moment of the tornado moving through Fairdale was captured by Daniel Abbott from the Northwest. It's wild to think that while Daniel was seeing this once-in-a-lifetime display of nature, Clem was experiencing this. At this point, the tornado had been on the ground for over half an hour, and the storm would briefly spit out another tornado, which was captured by Toby Hawk. The second tornado was anticyclonic, meaning it was rotating in the opposite direction to what most tornadoes rotate in the northern hemisphere. An anticyclonic twin like this only forms with the strongest tornadoes. Soon after, the main tornado dissipated. After 40 minutes and over 30 miles, the wrath of this beautiful but angry beast had come to an end. The storm went on to produce a few other tornadoes, none of which were particularly strong, and at this point, now 8 o'clock, the sun had fully set. The next morning, light was cast on the extreme damage produced by the generational tornado. The two worst hit neighborhoods were Cherry Hills and Fairdale. Response to the tornado was immediate. The nearby communities came together to clean up the mess, and the National Weather Service sent out multiple teams to document and survey the damage. The survey and final rating of the tornado would end up being extremely controversial. At six different locations, the National Weather Service assigned a rating of 200 miles per hour, giving the Rochelle tornado a final rating of EF4. At surface value, this isn't much of an issue, but when we unpack this and take a closer look at some of the damage, it's easy to see why many believed this tornado deserved the extremely rare EF5 rating. The most extreme damage caused by the tornado was in the Cherry Hills subdivision, where 10 homes were completely wiped off of their foundations. However, the three most severely damaged homes were these three, the Dickey Home, Belmont Home, and Haight Homes. The Dickey home had taken a direct hit by the violent core of the tornado, and the debris left was shredded to the point where it was totally unrecognizable. Same with the Belmont home, where the remnants of their home were dragged hundreds of feet into their backyard, and multiple cars were tossed, one of which was tossed over 300 feet into their neighbor's backyard. But perhaps the most compelling feat of damage occurred at the Haight family home which was hit by a subvortex on the north side of the tornado's core. The tornado actually displaced a concrete walkway, something you almost never see in tornado damage. But it wasn't just the walkway. The entire concrete foundation had been damaged by the tornado. This one home has sparked a lot of debate as to what wind speeds are required to do this level of damage. While Fairdale took a direct hit, it's pretty clear based on damage and videos of the tornado at the time, it was not at maximum strength here. But there is one other location that is potentially at EF5 level, the Dilling Farm, where a concrete silo was sheared off of its base. What's interesting about the farm is that it's located directly on the south side of the core of the tornado. And given the fact that tornadoes are both rotating and translating, the southeast side of the tornado is the side that results in the addition of both of these velocities. So this is where the worst damage would occur, and that's exactly what happened. You can also see the extreme ground scouring that went right through the Dilling Farm. Another issue is just how quickly the National Weather Service rated the tornado. The tornado was given a preliminary rating of EF4 the same day the survey was started, and the rating of EF4 200 miles per hour was finalized on the 13th, just four days after the tornado occurred, which also includes two days on the weekend. In my opinion, a detailed analysis cannot be completed in only a few days. And while an EF4 rating is not the end of the world, I more so have an issue with rating any tornado 200 miles per hour. If we look at the enhanced Fujita scale, we can see that EF4 ranges from 166 miles per hour to 200 miles per hour, and EF5 starts at 201 miles per hour which means that the Rochelle Tornado is technically the strongest tornado that didn't receive an EF5 rating. The Chickasha and Goldsby Tornadoes were also given an EF4 200 mile per hour rating. The difference between 200 and 201 is nothing, and it really feels like the EF5 rating was intentionally withheld for some reason. But I don't want to be overly negative and take away from the tragedy felt by the people who were affected by the tornado. The most important thing that happened after the tornado was that the people banded together to overcome this random act of nature. 
Multiple fundraisers were set up and surpassed their goals for both the Haight and Belmont families, and the Prices fully rebuilt their home only a few months after being destroyed by the tornado. Grubstakers has been totally rebuilt and is open to this day, and the owner, Ava, was given an award for her brave actions that saved her employees and customers. The town of Fairdale may now be missing some trees and homes on the north side of town, but they have recovered and there is now a memorial commemorating Jerry and Jackie. The feelings of the victims was best described by Joanna Whitaker, who lost her home and two dogs in Cherry Hills. A lot of that night and following days are still a blur to me. It was such a complicated mix of emotions as well. There is obviously a lot of sadness, but something that broke through all of that was the people. There was such an amazing outpouring of support from all around. People we didn't even know were sending us messages of support and donating money to help us out. It was one of those moments that helps you restore your faith in humanity.